It was two in the morning, and the apartment was silent. Jody, with her huge belly, struggled to find a comfortable position in bed. He, the tired has been snored nearby, and the clock on the wall counted the minutes. Sleep eluded Jody. Rolling from side to side, she attempted to ease the discomfort, but her back ate, and the twins inside seemed to be performing a rhythmic dance. Frowning, she gently stroked her belly, realizing that a good night's sleep was unlikely. Jody, waddling like a duck, made her way to the kitchen for some tea and a snack. Sad thoughts lingered in her mind. As her pregnancy progressed, carrying twins became increasingly challenging. Every simple household task became a struggle, and her husband offered no help or sympathy. Despite Horace's initial enthusiasm for her pregnancy and insistence on having an heir, his attitude changed drastically when they found out about the twins. Gone were his tender gestures and warm words. He no longer looked at her with love, no longer called her his princess. Instead, he complained about her weight gain and deemed her dull. Jody was hurt by his attitude, often crying in secret and worrying about the impending difficult childbirth, as doctors recommended a caesarean section due to the twin's size. Sighing heavily, Jody sipped her hot tea in the kitchen, reminiscing about better times. Jody grew up in a typical family with quiet and intelligent parents. Her mother worked as an accountant, while her father was a history professor at the university. They raised Jody to be polite, tactful, and compassionate, and their home was devoid of tantrums and scandals. After finishing school, Jody entered the university and excelled in her studies. However, tragedy struck when her parents fell seriously ill. First, her father passed away, and a year later, her mother succumbed to illness. Jody, burdened with medical expenses, had to sell the family apartment to cover the costs of surgeries and rehabilitation, but it couldn't save her parents. Alone and grieving, she moved into a dormitory, struggling to cope with their loss. Jody met Horace in an unconventional way. While studying at the pedagogical university, she needed a part-time job to make ends meet. With no one to support her after her parents' death, she placed an ad online offering assistance in preparing for foreign language exams. Jody was proficient in French, thanks to a dedicated high school teacher who instilled a love for the language in her. Beyond her formal education, she had taken additional lessons from a tutor and knew the subject thoroughly by the time she entered university. Setting a modest fee and honestly admitting her limited experience, Jody attracted Horace's attention. He, working as a manager in a company dealing with foreign clients, needed to communicate in basic language to assist them. The young couple immediately liked each other. Jody was initially a bit shy but made an effort to explain clearly and eloquently. Soon, Horace began to understand and even speak a bit of French. He paid more than the agreed-upon amount, praised Jody, admired her knowledge, and looked at her with intense emotion. In those moments, Jody's heart seemed to skip a beat. She blushed and veered off topic. Gradually, their relationship evolved from professional to friendly and then to romantic. Jody appreciated Horace's solidity and confidence, while he admired her purity and innocence. To him, Jody was like an unfolding flower youthful and beautiful and he desired to be her first. Additionally, Jody enjoyed organizing various celebrations. Their university had its own team for such events, and the creative young couple knew how to captivate and entertain party goers, earning them frequent invitations and decent pay. Soon, they got married, and Jody moved into her husband's apartment. Initially, everything was wonderful. Jody quickly adapted to domestic life, becoming a good homemaker who cooked delicious meals and took care of her husband's needs. However, there was one thing that bothered him Jody's attendance at traditional classes. He particularly disliked her occasional banquets. Horace felt intense jealousy towards her classmates, especially if she lingered after lectures or went for a brief coffee with them. Horace would erupt in fits of jealousy, arguing with her. He almost immediately convinced her to switch to distance learning. Darling, just think about it. 
Why do you need to go to lectures every day? It's a waste of time. I'll find you clients, and you can teach from home. Attend lectures only during exams a couple of times a year. You'll still get your diploma. Besides, think about the peace of mind it will bring me. Imagining you surrounded by your classmates sends shivers down my spine, and you'll organize holidays only for my company. A kind of family business, he insisted. Jody thought it over and agreed. She loved her man too much to resist his wishes. Initially, everything went as her has been predicted. Students came to their home for French lessons, and Jody enjoyed it. She prepared diligently, studied translations, and earned her money honestly. It flattered her to be praised, and she contributed to the family budget. She even organized a few events at her husband's workplace, and it went well. The employees liked her competitions and jokes. The director even took her phone number, promising to reach out if they needed her for future events. However, Horace quickly grew tired of it all. Strangers were constantly in their apartment, disrupting their peace and relaxation. He gradually pushed away both clients and Jody's friends. He argued that as a married woman, she didn't need to socialize with just anyone. It made Jody uncomfortable. She wasn't used to sitting idle. She was vibrant and active, but she endured it. As Horace's mother, Cassandra, often reminded her, Dear, never contradict your husband. Do as he says. Horace is the best, a hard-working, non-drinking man with an apartment. What more do you need? Friends come and go, but family is for life. Have a little one soon, and your Horace will stay by your side forever. Children strengthen a family, believe me. Moreover, her husband began to insist that it was time for them to have a child. What kind of family doesn't have kids? Jody didn't share this view. She wanted to at least finish university, work in her profession for a while, and then think about starting a family. But life had different plans. Jody soon became pregnant. At first, her husband was thrilled, but when he learned about the twins, he seemed to change before her eyes. By the end of a pregnancy, he looked at Jody with almost disgust, calling her fat, and all traces of past affection disappeared. The woman consoled herself as best as she could, thinking that when the babies were born, her figure would return to normal, and their relationship would warm up as he embraced his little ones. Sighing, Jody started bustling in the kitchen. It was already dawn, and Horace would soon wake up. The breakfast table was set with his favorite cereal and jam, along with coffee. He would surely be pleased. However, the surprise failed. Horace woke up in a bad mood, rubbed his eyes, and grumbled. Oh God, Jody, why were you making noise and clattering with dishes all night? Couldn't you sit quietly if you couldn't sleep? You sit at home all day doing nothing, while I have to work all day. You have no conscience. It hurt Jody so much. She was on the verge of tears. In a quivering voice, she replied, Is this your gratitude for breakfast? I tried so hard, made your favorite cereal, and walked. What do you mean I do nothing? I'm always busy. In case you haven't noticed, do you expect me to work with this belly? And anyway, it was you, Horace, who forbade me to work. Lately, you seem to have no conscience. If you treat me like this now and everything irritates you, what will happen when the babies start crying? And there will be so many expenses. The kids will need so much. Or will that also fall on my shoulders? It seems to me you begged me to give you an heir. Well, rejoice. You'll have two at once. What's wrong again? Horace responded displeasedly. Thanks for breakfast, dear, but I need to go. The great joy of screaming kids around the claw. I don't even want to think about it yet. Okay, don't be upset. I just didn't get enough sleep. I'll be late. Don't wait for me. He rushed off to work without even thanking her for the perfectly ironed shirt and polished shoes. Jody awkwardly tidied up the table, pondering sadly where the tenderness and warmth in their relationship had gone and whether there was any love left between them now. Maybe all families live like this. And is it only in TV shows that they portray happy couples? 
As Horace arrived at work, he immediately made a call. His voice softened, and a smile never left his face. Hello, my dear. How did you sleep? Did you miss me, my darling, today, after work? Of course, I can. I missed you too, Kelly. I love you so much. Just then, his director, Welfred, entered the office, and Horace abruptly ended the call, focusing on work. Wilfred thought to himself, well, he just arrived from home, and he already misses someone. Now, that's love. But when Wilfred accidentally bumped into Horace after work, he was stunned. Horace was walking arm in arm with a young intern from their department, Kelly, and that was definitely not his wife. Suddenly, the director remembered that in the morning conversation, Horace mentioned someone named Kelly. But his wife's name wasn't like that. She had organized several events for their company, and he would surely recognize the beautiful and statuesque, red-haired Jody. Does this mean that Horace is cheating on his wife and having an affair with a colleague? A very unpleasant situation. From that day on, Wilfred began to keep a close eye on Horace, and his suspicions were confirmed. When his wife called, Horace grimaced, spoke sharply, reluctantly, and quickly. But when Kelly approached his desk, everything changed. Horace immediately melted like ice cream and looked at her with loving eyes. The lady dressed vulgarly and provocatively, deliberately lowering a prospective suitor into her feminine nets. Wilfred had reprimanded her several times about her appearance, but it worked flawlessly on Horace. He drooled at the sight of the fatal beauty. The director disapproved of such behavior, considering such actions by men immoral, and there was a reason for that. Three years ago, Wilfred lost his beloved wife, Nancy. They lived happily, with a strong bond between them. Nancy had a long and difficult illness, and she passed away in his arms. His daughter, Isabella, a five-year-old, was left in his care. He lived for her, not even looking at other women. In his heart, there was still no place for anyone but his beloved Nancy. What particularly disturbed him was when Horace's wife asked him over the phone to buy oranges and an orthopedic pillow because she seemed to be pregnant, and he yelled at her that he didn't have time to buy any nonsense. And on the same day, he walked arm in arm with Kelly, not hiding it at all. This audacious girl immediately latched onto the enviable cavalier, and the detail of a pregnant wife didn't bother her at all. Wilfred remembered how he spoke with Horace's wife while preparing for the celebration she organized. Compared to Kelly, Jody was a hundred times better and smarter, a pleasure to talk to. And what did Horace find in this foolish girl? While the director was deciding whether to intervene in someone else's relationship and inform Jody about her husband's infidelity, or perhaps talk to Horace himself, scold him, or not get involved at all, something happened. Jody had long been asking her husband to help her clean the windows since she was no longer up to the task. But he always cited business, fatigue, and fed her promises. Christmas was approaching, and she wanted the apartment to be clean. The woman decided to at least try to clean the windows herself. She took a cloth, a bucket of water, and climbed onto a chair with difficulty. But before she could start, the chair's legs suddenly spread apart and Jody fell to the floor with a crash. Immediately, her back hurt like hell, and a pulling sensation in her lower abdomen. She riffed in pain and couldn't get up on her own. A couple of minutes later, something seemed to explode inside her, and a small puddle formed beneath her. Jody panicked and immediately realized she was going into premature labor because she still had almost a month to go before the due date. In a panic, she fumbled for her husband's phone in the robe pocket and began to dial, but he didn't answer. Jody moaned, as always. When I need Horace so much, he's not around. Lord, it hurts so much. Jody called an ambulance, and luckily, the front door was not locked, allowing the medics to quickly enter the apartment. As they carried her on a stretcher, almost losing consciousness from pain and fear, the distraught woman sent a text message to her husband. Come to the maternity hospital quickly, please. I'm in labor. In her panic, she mixed up contacts without checking the phone screen, 
and she actually sent the message to their director, Horace, as their numbers were next to each other. Wilfred was very surprised by the strange message from a colleague's wife. It was unclear why he should go to the maternity hospital. Why him and not her has been? What was happening? Horace wasn't at his workplace, and there was no one to ask. The deputy said he had taken time off for an important matter. Wilfred tried calling him, but Horace stubbornly refused to answer. This even annoyed the man. How could someone be so infantile when his wife was about to give birth? The director pondered, maybe I should really go. What if something happened and the poor woman needs help? Without hesitation, he immediately went to the maternity hospital. He waited for three hours before he was finally informed that Jody had given birth to win boys. The babies were weak and they needed to be observed. The doctor shook Wilfred's hand, congratulated him, thinking he was the father worried about his wife's fate. Don't worry, everything is fine with your wife. She did great and endured everything bravely, but she'll have to stay with us. The birth was premature and we need to monitor the babies for now. Wilfred felt awkward. He didn't know how to say that he wasn't Jody's husband. Then he suddenly asked, can I see Jody for a moment? I need to tell her something important. Please. The doctor frowned. That's out of the question. Come back tomorrow. She'll be out briefly. I'll make arrangements. You can give her a note if you want. Wilfred immediately wrote on a piece of paper. Jody, I received your SMS. What happened? Do you need any help? The nurse took the note, and Wilfred waited in the corridor. After some time, they brought him a response. He unfolded the piece of paper. I'm sorry, Wilfred, it's a silly situation. I just panicked, still can't reach my husband. I mistakenly dialed the wrong number. Please tell Horace to come to the maternity hospital urgently. I'm begging you. The director left and tried calling Horace again, but he remained unreachable. So, the director went to his house, having obtained the address at work, but no one was there either. Strangely enough, Kelly had also disappeared. A terrible suspicion suddenly struck the director. Could this scoundrel be enjoying himself with his lover right now? At such a crucial moment, when his wife needs his help and support. This goes beyond all my understanding. But how do I tell Jody about this? What if stress affects her milk production? I can abandon her until everything is clear. I'll visit, help, just be humane. That's what the director did. He visited Jody every day, covered the expenses for the baby's treatments, and bought everything necessary for the new mother. She thanked him, saying, thank you, Wilfred. I feel so embarrassed. As soon as Horace shows up, I'll repay you immediately. Do you know where he is? I'm really worried. I've imagined all sorts of things. I'm sure he's in trouble. Maybe we should start calling morgues and hospitals. What should I do? The man encouraged her, saying, first of all, you need to calm down, stop stressing yourself, and focus on the children. They are the most important right now. Your husband will show up soon, I'm sure, and he'll explain everything. My deputy is calling. Maybe there's some news. Wilfred spoke on the phone and then told Jody. Horace passed on through one of the colleagues that he ended up in the hospital. Nothing serious, but he's in another city. He told you not to worry. Jody jumped on the bed, exclaiming, in the hospital. What happened to him? I knew it. My Horace is in trouble. Lord, I'll go crazy with all this. Wilfred took her hand, saying, Jody, please don't worry. He mentioned that it's nothing serious. Relax. Until your husband shows up, I'll be here. I won't abandon you. Don't worry, everything will be fine, you'll see. In reality, the director understood that it wasn't so simple. He was just comforting the woman. Everything that was happening was more than strange. Horace disappeared, Kelly too, and what hospital could be in another city? It was nonsense. This scoundrel Horace was clearly shamelessly lying. For a whole week, Wilfred visited Jody, and they talked a lot. The man sadly thought, such a wonderful woman doesn't deserve such a vile person as Horace. Ah, uh, if only she were his wife, 
He wouldn't trade her for a lover, but would cherish the warmth of a family heart. Doesn't Horace understand what he's losing? Over these days, Jody unintentionally grew attached to Welfrud and compared him to her husband. He was so intelligent, tactful, and kind-hearted. He cared for her, even though she was a complete stranger to him, and her husband. How could he act like this? Even if he was in the hospital, couldn't he call? Let them know about himself. How could someone be so indifferent and callous, as if he didn't care about her or their sons at all? The babies were the only solace for the woman during this difficult time. She couldn't take her eyes off them, constantly held her beloved little boys close to her chest, and whispered to them tenderly, My darlings, how much you resemble your dad. Only your dad has disappeared somewhere. Well, never mind, he'll be found, come home, look at such handsome boys, and immediately fall in love with you. How can anyone not love such sweet little boys? The day of discharge from the maternity ward arrived, but Horace never showed up. Wilfred took charge of everything once again. He helped Jody get home with the babies, carried them into the apartment. Jody looked around and couldn't comprehend. There were no husband's clothes on the hanger, no shoes in the hallway, and no laptop, TV, or money in the box, not a single cent. Horace took all their savings. Jody clutched her heart, still not understanding anything, and went to the kitchen. And only there, on the table, she saw a note. I'm leaving you. We're getting divorced. I'm sorry, but it has to be this way. That was it, no explanations, nothing. Jody collapsed onto a chair, started sobbing loudly. I don't believe it. Lord, what did I do to deserve such a blow? What did I do wrong? Why did Horace stop loving me? He himself begged me to give him an heir. And now what? How will I live with two little ones? Who will need me with them? I hate him. And she burst into tears, having a real breakdown. Wilfred didn't know what to do. The children were crying louder and louder, as if sensing their mother's state. The man frantically rocked one, then the other, and finally put the babies on the couch and rest them. They calmed down a bit. Then Wilfred poured a glass of water, handed it to the woman, and said, Jody, drink up. Don't scare the children. Stop the hysteria. Come on, slowly, with small sips. Like this. He handed her a handkerchief. The woman quieted down, wiped away the tears, only softly sobbing. Then, as if coming to her senses, she rushed to the children, closed the bedroom door, fed, and immediately, they fell asleep. The woman returned to the kitchen. Wilfred sighed, sat across from her, and took her hands. Jody, I need to tell you something. There's absolutely no blame on your part for Horace leaving. Believe me, I've seen him several times with another woman, a colleague from our company. They're lovers. So don't torment yourself. Don't blame yourself. Your Horace is just an idiot. I'll never understand him. Jody covered her face with her hands. I can't believe this. I loved him so much, and he. I tried to be a good housewife. I did everything myself until the very end. Hot lunches, iron shirts, everything for my beloved. And him. How painful this is for me now. How terrifying. For what? Why did Horace betray me so maliciously? Forgive me for unloading all this on you. You're not obliged to fuss over me like this. You surely have your own matters. Your family is waiting for you. I don't know how to live. If not for the children, I'd probably just lie down and die. Jody cried again, unable to cope with the overwhelming grief. The man approached, embraced her, and stroked her shoulders. He felt unbearably sorry for this wonderful woman, whose his been turned out to be such a scoundrel. He spoke softly in her ear. Jody, try to calm down, for the sake of the little ones. They feel everything and will cry too. Your milk might disappear. Don't worry about anything. I'll always be around. Here, take this money. It should last for a while. Look at it from a different perspective. You're not alone. You have two sons, and that's already a real family. They'll grow up, become your support and anchor. Let your husband regret losing such a woman. You're amazing. I remember your banquets. 
Once the little ones grow a bit, you can get back to what you love, and I'll help. But for now, don't think about anything and live for the children. The pain will fade with time. Subside. I know what I'm talking about. I lost my beloved wife three years ago. Now I'm raising my daughter, Isabella. She's my reason for living. Together, we'll get through this. You have to believe. After the dark times, the bright ones will come. You'll see. Jody forced a grateful smile. Thank you, Wilfra, for your help, for your support. It's crucial and necessary for me right now, like hair. You're right. I need to keep living, pull myself together. The little ones are innocent in all this. You probably need to go now, right? You have a child at home too. Come to visit me more often with your daughter. It'll make me happier and you'll be calmer. I'll be waiting for you eagerly. I've never met men like you, I swear. My deepest bow to you. They said their goodbyes, and Jody went to her sons, contemplating the director's words for a long time. After all, he was right in many ways. It was necessary to eradicate this scoundrel from her mind and her life. Uproot the love for him and live for her beloved children. Money is a trivial matter. Indeed, she could resume teaching, organize events. The whole night, she didn't sleep. Stood by the window, watching snowflakes twirl in the light of the lanterns. How frost painted patterns on the window. What a beautiful and festive city on the eve of Christmas. And her heart was compressed with resentment. Everyone would celebrate Christmas surrounded by family, congratulate each other, wish happiness. And only she would be alone with her sons, whose father had abandoned them. The next day, Jody was busy in the kitchen, preparing formula for the little ones when suddenly the phone rang. She even jumped. It was Horace. The woman's heart pounded furiously. Could he have changed his mind? Beloved, what if we reconcile? But her hopes shattered in the first minute of the conversation. Her husband was drunk, and in the background, there was the sound of a woman's laughter. This infuriated Jody, and she sharply replied, What do you want? You, it seems, abandoned me. Why are you calling then? Or did your conscience finally bother you? Do you even know, you scoundrel, that all this time it's your director who has been supporting me? If not for him, I don't know how I would have coped. Aren't you ashamed? Is your lover even worth it now? The heirs are of no use to you anymore. Hearing about the director, Horace immediately flew into a rage and started shouting into the phone. You even played a victim. Meeting my director, probably even having kids with him. No wonder I left you. And soon your beloved Wilfred will face bankruptcy. I'll sell all his best developments to competitors. I work for them now. And one more thing, the apartment is mine. So, I'm giving you a month to move out. Got it? Jody was in such shock. It felt like she'd been scalded with boiling water. She didn't even bother to defend herself. She just quietly said, You're such scum, Horace. How did I not notice this before? Fate will punish you for everything. Don't call me again. Jody hung up the phone and burst into tears. It hurt so much, and she felt so offended. Her family fell apart like a house of cards, and Horace stooped so low. He didn't even have the courage to talk, to confess to his betrayal. Instead, he chose to accuse Jody of the divorce, portraying her as dishonorable. It was so vile, so disgusting. Remembering her drunk husband's words, she immediately called Wilfred. I have important information for you. Horace called. He was certainly very drunk but he boasted that he would sell some of your developments to competitors. I must warn you, what if it's true? And he also told me to leave his apartment. Do you know where I can rent a place inexpensively? Wilfred immediately responded. I understand you, Jody, thank you. I'll check this information. Pack your things and get ready. I'll come for you. Everything will be fine, I promise. Jody was extremely surprised but did as Wilfred instructed and waited for him. He arrived quickly, took her suitcase, one of the little ones, and commanded, you better not stay here. Who knows what your deranged ex has in mind, especially with Christmas approaching. I'm taking you and the kids to my place. 
and that's not up for discussion. I have a big house. There's enough room for everyone. I'll settle you and the kids in a cozy room. I'll prepare everything for the little ones. I talked to my daughter. She doesn't mind, even welcome the idea. She gets bored alone. After all, I'm often not home. So, we're leaving. Please, don't regret anything. This scoundrel is not worthy of you. He doesn't appreciate love. Let him live as he pleases. Jody was bewildered. She couldn't believe that a complete stranger to her would take care of her so much. Thank you, Wilfred. I don't know how to thank you. And won't my kids be a bother to you? After all, two infants. Wilfred sighed. After my wife's death, being alone is so hard for me that I'll be happy, and it'll be livelier for my daughter. You won't be a bother to anyone. You're going through such a difficult period now. It's better not to stay alone to avoid dwelling on the bad. So, let's help each other, support each other. Is that so bad? The next day, Wilfred turned the situation around. He raised the alarm with security, interrogated everyone, and searched every inch of the office. The shocking facts came to light. Two folders with drawings and developments of a unique technology for processing parts had disappeared. Apparently, Horace intended to sell them to competitors. Some employees admitted they had long suspected Horace and had guessed that he had switched to another company, along with Kelly. She was specifically hired here to seduce Horace and persuade him to commit this treachery. It must be said that the lady did a brilliant job with her task. Wilfred found out where the meeting would take place and went there with the police. The criminals were apprehended on the spot because all the sheets of drawings had the company's stamp and were accounted for copies. Horace had no right to take them out of the building. Now he faced the punishment he deserved. But for Wilfred, that wasn't enough. He insisted on meeting Horace in the isolation room, wanting to look the scoundrel in the eyes and personally ask why he betrayed him and treated his wife so maliciously. The director couldn't comprehend these despicable actions. The investigator agreed and arranged the meeting. Wilfred entered the room. He was so angry with Horace that he was ready to tear him apart. However, when he saw Horace trembling and cowering, it even became amusing. There was no trace of his former confidence. The man sat quietly, nervously tapping his foot on the chair's leg. He didn't know where to hide his shame. For a few minutes, they just stared at each other, as if assessing. Horace broke the silence. Why did you come? To mock me? To humiliate me? Well, enjoy it. I'm in prison now. Wilfred replied. I came to look into your shameless eyes. How did you manage to pull all this off? You almost set me up, scoundrel. You forget quickly. I taught you everything. Horace treated you kindly, paid regular bonuses. And this is how you repay me. And what about your wife? What did she do wrong? She gave you children, and you ran away to that clueless doll. And now, do you regret it? Horace lowered his head. He was ashamed. Kelly messed with my head right away. I fell in love with her head over heels. It turns out she worked for our competitors. She told me in bed and convinced me to organize all this promised that they would immediately give me a managerial position in their company, and the salary she mentioned made me whistle in surprise. Who wouldn't want to live like a king? So, I agree. As for Jody, I just chickened out, honestly. I loved her at first, it seemed, but then I got bored. I even asked her to have a child for me, it seemed so cool to have a son. But when I found out about the twins, I felt uncomfortable. I wasn't ready to handle two children. And then the affair with Kelly flared up so unexpectedly. That's when I cooled off towards my wife. She started annoying me, became stupid and overweight. But I didn't know how to confess everything to her. How to tell a pregnant wife that I fell out of love and was leaving for another. A stupid situation. So, I ran away. Wilfred was stunned by this. He even coughed, you scoundrel. Okay, let's assume everything happened as you say, and you shamefully ran away. But how could you leave a woman with two infants without money? Well, 
Prison will teach you everything. There are worse cases than yours. Horace suddenly started whining. Wilfred, please, have mercy. Withdraw the complaint. Everything ended well, and I'll never do anything like that again, I swear. I don't even know what got into me, forgive me. Want me to go back to my wife? Just don't send me to prison. The director laughed. No, I definitely don't want that. Why would Jody need a has-been like you? What will you teach the children? Lies, deceit, and you'll just ruin your wife's life. You don't love her or you would never let her go. So, you don't want prison. Then I have an offer for you. I withdraw the complaint and settle all other issues, and you officially renounce your children, divorce Jody, and permanently disappear from the city in our lives. How about that? But if you try to break the agreement, I'll release all the materials. Horace immediately burst into tears. Thank you. I understand everything, and I agree to everything. As soon as I get out of here, I'll buy a ticket and leave the country immediately. I promise you won't see me again. And Jody, how will she manage alone? And what about my apartment? The director clapped his hands on his knees. Did these questions not bother you much before? So, Jody concerns you, or your apartment. You've really messed up. She doesn't need your apartment. Jody won't be left alone. Not everyone in the world is as idiotic as you. But that's no longer your concern. After the meeting with Horace, Wilfred went home. As he entered, a delightful aroma of soup and baking enveloped him. A smile spread across his face. It had been so long since anyone had cooked such delicious meals in his house after his wife's death. In the kitchen, he encountered an endearing scene. His daughter Isabella and Jody were making buns. The little girl's cheeks and hands were covered in flour, but her eyes sparkled with joy. The twins were peacefully sleeping in their stroller. Seeing her father, Isabella rushed towards him, jumping on his neck. Dad is here. Hooray. You won't believe it, but I can peel potatoes by myself now. Jody taught me, and we kneaded the dough together. You know, it's quite challenging, it turns out. And we cooked soup. I stirred everything in the pot. I really liked it. I've decided. When I grow up, I'll definitely become a chef. Wilfred laughed, kissed his little princess, and praised her. You're so clever, my helper. How are things here? Looks like you're getting along well. How are the babies? Cried a lot. Isabella shook her head. No, just a little when they wanted to eat. Bernard cries louder, but Ian, like a girl, is very quiet. Jody allowed me to soothe them. She's very nice. Jody also laughed. You have such a lovely daughter, so mature and sensible beyond her years. It's so interesting with her. My hands are busy, so sit at the table. We'll feed you. You look very tired, circles under your eyes. Did something happen? Wilfred replied. Well, actually, yes. I leap first, and then I'll tell you everything. I've been busy with work all morning, didn't eat anything. He ate with such appetite. Everything was incredibly delicious. He praised Jody. Jody, you're a delight. No one has fed me so deliciously in ages. Thank you, Isabella. I bought you a new album and paints. Go, dear, draw. Jody and I need to talk. The understanding girl nodded and went to her room. Wilfred took a recorder from his briefcase. Then, he looked at Jody intently and said, I met with Horace today at the investigative isolation ward and proposed a certain agreement to him. Here's the recording of our conversation. I want you to hear it yourself. Listen, think, and then tell me if I did the right thing. If I'm wrong and you want him back, I'll understand and won't object. It's up to you. Wilfred wheeled the stroller into the room, intentionally leaving Jody alone and closing the door. He wanted her to take her time to contemplate everything. He wondered if he had taken on too much. He had confronted Horace, but what if Jody still loved him and was ready to be with him again? Or perhaps she wanted him to be involved with the children. Well, Fred decided to give her the opportunity to make the decision for herself. He understood that everything she would hear would bring her pain and suffering, 
but going through it was better than indulging in false hopes. Half an hour passed, and Jody did not emerge from the kitchen. Wilfred started to worry, and the babies had awakened and started crying. He transferred the infants to the bed, where Isabelle entertained them, and Wilfred decided to peek into the kitchen. Jody sat there in tears, rocking back and forth on the chair, staring blankly ahead. He was genuinely concerned. He quietly embraced her shoulders and asked, How are you? I understand it's stuff. And I don't know how to help. I'll only say one thing I won't leave you. Not now. Not later. With your presence, my home came alive. It became warm and cozy. And I won't let you go for anything. But the decision, of course, is yours. Jody looked at Wilfred intently and replied, It hurts to say this. But you, Wilfred, did everything right. Honestly, despite Maya's Ben's deceit and betrayal, I still held on to the hope that he genuinely loved me, that he would come to his senses soon and return. But after what I heard, I can't live under the same roof with this person ever again. Never. But if you knew how much I love him, how painful this vile betrayal is, why didn't I notice before what he was like? Horace didn't become like this yesterday. He was always selfish. I dropped my in-person studies, tutoring, banquets all for him. I stayed at home, gave birth to children, and he sneakily ran off with the first girl he came across. Nothing to regret. Wilfred quietly responded, Don't cry, Jody. Time heals. You're not alone. Isabella and I are here. Everything will be fine. We just need to get through this. Come, the little ones are hungry, and our daughter is trying to cheer them up as best as she can. Jody smiled through her tears and said, What a blessing that I dialed the wrong number that day. Thank you for being there and supporting me so much. Even my ex-husband never did as much. I'm so grateful to you. From that day on, Jody's life took a new, different, interesting, and fulfilling turn. Christmas was warm and family-oriented. They decorated a huge Christmas tree together, watched a concert, enjoyed delicious food, and, in the early morning, placed gifts under the tree for Isabella. Jody's heart felt a bit warmer, lighter. She realized that she wasn't alone on this earth, that she was welcomed here, and things became calmer and easier. Initially, it was undoubtedly challenging for her to manage three children. Well, Fred made an effort to help preparing meals on weekends, doing the dishes, and happily playing with the kids. His parents also pitched in, treating Jody's little ones as their own grandchildren. They were delighted that their son had finally recovered from the loss of his wife and found a family again. So, they occasionally took the kids, allowing Jody some time to relax. Jody often pondered how life could be so remarkable and unpredictable. Her biological father had rejected the children never even holding them, while Wilfred and his parents cared for them, playing with the little ones. People could be so different, some devoid of any compassion, while others were full of love and empathy for others. As Bernard and Ian grew, they became familiar with Wilfred, smiled, and their daughter came to life. It was evident that she enjoyed the newfound joy in the house. For a long time, Jody and Wilfred were simply friends, having become kindred spirits. However, there was no talk of closeness or love. Though Wilfred was fond of her, he didn't want to pressure her and decided to be there for her, offering support. He understood that Jody was going through a tough time, having experienced her husband's betrayal, with small children to care for. She needed time to recover and start a new life. Initially, Jody devoted herself entirely to the children, giving them all her time. There were many responsibilities, but she still managed to pay attention to Isabella. When the twins turned three and Isabella was already in the third grade, Jody decided to focus on herself. She returned to university, refreshed her knowledge, and resumed her favorite activity teaching French lessons at home. Unlike Horace, Wilfred encouraged her pursuits, praising her for not sitting idly and continuing to grow. Isabella benefited from this now being the best in her class in French. Over the years, she grew attached to Jody, 
loving her as a mother and looking after Bernard and Yin like an older sister. Meanwhile, life had not been kind to Horace. Kelly left him immediately after he was sentenced, and he went back to his mother's homeland. He was left out of the loop of life. His mother scolded him for abandoning his family and losing his job, and Horace increasingly drowned his sorrows in alcohol. The thought that his sons now called another man dad haunted him, and he, their biological father, became a stranger to them. Only now, with the years passing, did he realize how he had acted despicably and how empty and pointless his life had become. A celebration was on the horizon in the director's family his daughter's ninth birthday. The little girl had long asked for a bicycle, and Wilfred and Jody presented her with one. They joyously celebrated the birthday, with Jody entertaining the girl's friends as an animator. It turned out to be a wonderful celebration, with no one feeling bored. The next day, after school, Isabella expressed her desire to ride her new bike. However, she wasn't very confident in riding yet and was a bit scared. Out of kindness, Jody agreed. Sweetie, I don't mind. I understand how eager you are to ride but practice in the backyard for now. Don't go out on the street by yourself. I'll finish preparing lunch, dress the little ones, and then we'll head to the park. Okay, the girl was delighted and immediately rushed to master the bicycle. Jody, glancing at her from the window, got distracted while dressing the boys. When she went out to the yard with them, she was horrified to see that the gate was wide open and Isabella was nowhere in sight. Jody was angered and went to look for her with the boys. From a distance, she saw the girl speeding down a hill on her bike towards the road and shouted, Isabella, why did you leave without asking? We didn't agree on this. Slow down, or you'll end up on the road. Isabella, come on, slow down. I can't catch up with you. But the girl closed her eyes in fear and panic, shouting, I can't do it. It's not working. She was searching for the brake with her foot, but it was on the handlebars. In an instant, her bicycle darted onto the road, and a car was speeding straight toward her. Jody screamed in horror, managing only to yell to the boys, Please, stay in place. Don't follow me. And she rushed to save the girl. Miraculously, she managed to push her away, but the bumper caught her firmly. Chaos ensued. A crowd gathered. The boy screamed and cried, trying to break through. Isabella was also wailing, wiping her bruised elbows and knees, and Jody attempted to stand up, but the intense pain in her back prevented her. Shaking hands, she dialed Wilfred's number. Come home quickly. I've been hit by a car. The kids are alive. Wilfred immediately dropped everything and rushed home. On the way, he noticed a crowd of people, an ambulance. Inside the car on a stretcher lay Jody, while all three children sat on the seat, clinging to her and crying louder than each other. Isabella sobbed. Jody, forgive me. I didn't mean to. I'll never do it again. Does it hurt a lot? Are you going to die? In this chaos, Wilfred barely figured out what was happening. He immediately called his parents, explained everything, and asked them to take care of the children. The frightened grandparents hurriedly arrived, took the little ones, and promised to look after them for as long as necessary. Wilfred went to the hospital with Jody. He waited in the corridor for a long time while she was examined and x-rayed, and then the doctor called him into the office. I can't give you good news. Unfortunately, your wife has fractures in two vertebrae. She needs urgent surgery, and any delay could leave her disabled. We've taken all the tests, and she has poor blood clotting. She will likely need a transfusion. However, Jody has a rare blood type, and finding donor material will be challenging. Wilfred exclaimed, Good grief. My late wife had the same blood type. Can such coincidences happen? The doctor pondered, If you have children, you can compare the blood type of your child with that of your second wife. It will be immediately apparent whether they are relatives or not. But that's for later. Are you ready to pay for an expensive operation? Wilfred was trembling. In that very second, he suddenly realized how much he loved Jody and how afraid he was of losing her. He almost shouted, 
Of course, I'll pay for everything. Do it. Save her, I beg you. When they were taking Jody away on a stretcher, Wilfred ran up to her, hugged her tightly, his eyes filled with tears, and he sincerely whispered to her, Don't be afraid of anything. I love you, do you hear me, Jody? I love you more than life. Don't you dare die. I can't live without you. We can't. I won't go anywhere. I'll be with you. Jody cried. How long she had waited for these words. How she hoped that someday she would hear them. She whispered, I love you too, Wilfred. Thank you for everything. You're my guardian angel. I'm sorry I didn't watch over Isabella. The man replied, It's thanks to you. You saved her life. You threw yourself under the wheels to save her. Jody was taken away, but Wilfred didn't sit idle. He called blood transfusion centers, searching for blood of the right type. Luckily, they found the blood, and the transfusion was successful. For four long hours, he couldn't find a place for himself while the operation was underway. He prayed to the Lord as best as he could for Jody to survive. He blamed himself for not telling her once in all these years how much he loved her and how afraid he was of losing her. Finally, the doctor came out and reassured him. It's all over. Don't worry. We acted in time, and I'm satisfied with the results. Go home. They won't let you see her today. She's in the intensive care unit. Come back tomorrow. The surgery was successful, and Jody quickly recovered. Wilfred and the children visited her every day. He postponed all his business and managed the company from home. Isabella's blood was tested, and it was compared with Jody's blood type. It turned out they were not strangers. They were most likely aunt and niece. Genetic testing confirmed this. Everyone was shocked, especially Jody. She had grown up in an ordinary family, and her parents loved her very much. It couldn't be that she was adopted. Unfortunately, her parents had already passed away, and there was no one to ask. Well, Fred wasn't discouraged. He had a determined character and had to get to the truth in any matter. So, he hired private detectives who conducted a thorough investigation. They managed to find an elderly midwife who attended the birth of Jody's biological mother and Nancy. She revealed everything. On that day, they brought a young mother to us. She was just a kid, not even 18 yet. But she was from a wealthy family and got pregnant by some fleeting admirer. So, her mother arranged everything as if the children died during childbirth, two girls, unwanted grandchildren from an unclear father. They didn't dare to perform an abortion, so they hid the girl, concealed her belly. Everything was secreted. I was paid very well back then. The girl gave birth. Her mother took her and left. They gave her a certificate that the babies were stillborn. The rich lady quietly placed the little girls in various shelters so that no one would ever find out. And after that, I don't know what happened. I would have taken this secret to the grave if you hadn't shown up. The girl had a rare last name. It stuck in my memory. The detectives then started searching the shelters and managed to uncover everything. Jody was adopted almost immediately by a childless couple when she was still a baby. They gave her their last name and raised her as their own daughter. Nancy was also adopted but at the age of five. The girls had no idea that each of them had a biological sister. Wilfred was astonished. That must be why, subconsciously, he was drawn to Jody from the beginning. Although Jody and his late sister Nancy didn't look very similar externally, they weren't twins. They were just sisters. When Jody fully recovered and regained her strength, the first thing she did was go with Wilfred to the cemetery to visit her biological sister. She cried for a long time at the grave, lamenting the unfortunate separation between them. They lived in the same city, walked the same streets, and yet they didn't know each other. After everything that happened, the young couple stopped holding back their feelings, no longer hiding their love for each other, and soon decided to get married. They didn't have grand celebrations. They signed the papers modestly and celebrated within the family circle. Kissing each other passionately on their first wedding night, Jody laughed. How much I love you, darling. 
I'm only afraid of one thing getting pregnant. What if you run away then? Wilfred kissed her fervently and whispered. You picked the wrong one to mess with. I love you even if we open a daycare at home. You're the most precious thing to me, and I'll go to any lengths for my family. Just know that. And I'll never give you up, never trade you for anyone. Don't worry. Jody dreamily exclaimed, choking with delight. I'm so happy that I dialed the wrong number back then. 